and welcome to our lesson on the ultrastructure of cells. So in the IB world, when we're talking about the ultrastructure, we're really just talking about zooming in and looking at tiny, tiny little details. So ultrastructure of cells is simply uh, those organelles, that, that microscopic structure that we can find. So, so we know that eukaryotic cells are more complex than prokaryotic cells. If you don't remember the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, I have a lovely mnemonic. So how I remember the difference, pro rhymes with no, because prokaryotes have no nucleus. Whereas you rhymes with new, because eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. So that's how to remember the difference between the two. So prokaryotic cells like this guy here have no nucleus. Eukaryotic cells like these guys up here and our cells do have nuclei. And those eukaryotic structures are far more complex because they have lots of compartments. And we'll talk about those. So this is the same picture that was on the last slide, just larger. So we can look at some of that complexity in the eukaryotic cells. So this is an animal cell and this is a plant cell. These are both eukaryotic cells and you can see that there are bubbles and then there are bubbles in bubbles and there are more bubbles and more bubbles and some squiggly things. And so all of these different compartments, these different specialized structures inside the cells make it very complex. Whereas our prokaryotic cells like this guy, it's a bacteria cell. There's like an outside covering and then just lots of mushy stuff inside. So far more simple internal structure but still able to carry out lots and lots of life functions. So how we know what the ultrastructure of cells looks like is by using microscopes, these amazing pieces of technology that allow us to see what is inside these cells. Two kinds of microscopes that we need to know about. There are these light microscopes and then over here, this is an electron microscope. Light microscopes, we have these here at school. They cost a couple hundred dollars each um, and they can magnify pretty well up to maybe 400 times. So if something was one centimeter big, we could see it at 400 centimeters big instead. Whereas this electron microscope, we can actually magnify it about 10 million times. We can make things look 10 million times bigger but you can see the environment that the electron microscope needs to be kept in is pretty amazing. There's lots of um, insulation here, all kinds of special filtration devices. The lights have to be kept down pretty low. Electron beams do get sent through these tubes and then an amazing picture pops up on the screen. These guys can run a couple hundred thousand dollars each up to millions of dollars each. And, and no, we, we don't have any of those at school. Um, what we do have at school are these light microscopes and they do work really well for what we need them to do. So we're gonna talk about magnification in a learning experience coming up in a little bit. And when we're talking about the magnification of a light microscope, we're looking at the product of the eyepiece or the ocular lens and the objective lens. So the eyepiece is a little piece of glass here that starts the magnification process. There's another lens, another piece of glass here that adds to that magnification. We just multiply those two. And so if the ocular piece is like a 10X and the objective is 40X, then the combined magnification would be 10 times 40, 400 times as big. Easy peasy. One of the benefits of an electron microscope over a light microscope is resolution. Resolution is the ability for us to differentiate between two objects that are very close to each other. So we could have these two guys. I can clearly see that they are far apart from each other, but what if I had those two, whoopsie, those two guys, it's a little harder to tell that they're two separate pieces. That's the idea of resolution. And, and we calculate resolution by looking at this pixelation, how many pixels there are, how many different unique pieces of the picture are being put together um, to give us our whole. And when we're looking at light microscopes, I could have two things that are 0.2 micrometers. This weird uh, U thing is the Greek letter mu, and we use it to represent the prefix micro in metric system, so micrometer or a micrometer. Sometimes we get super lazy and we just call it a micron. Totally the same thing. 
So I could have two objects that are 0.2 micrometers apart from each other, and I could tell the difference between them in my light microscope. But if I had something that was only 0.1 micrometer away from something else in my light microscope, they would blur together. It would look like a single object. Whereas in my electron microscope, we can get two things that are only 0.001 micrometers apart from each other, about 200 times closer to each other, and I would still be able to tell them apart in my, in my electron microscope. Light microscopes can magnify to about 400 times before the quality of what we see decreases drastically. Whereas our electron microscopes, oh my gosh, 10 million times magnification. It's amazing. And so our light microscopes help us see cell structure quite well, but that ultra structure, if we're looking for very small things like ribosomes, we really need to use an electron microscope instead. One of the huge benefits of a light microscope, besides cost, um, is that we can actually put living specimens on a microscope slide in our, in our light microscopes and we can view these things while they're still alive. So I could pull some pond water out, put that pond water on a glass slide, put it in my microscope, and I could see all kinds of cool cells swimming around in that pond water on my microscope slide. Whereas in the electron microscope, we have to pretty much freeze dry stuff and slice it or just do a surface scan. So living things, not an option to be viewed in the electron microscope. And of course, the other benefit of the light microscope is definitely that we can afford them. <laughs> this electron microscope's not so much in our budget. All right, let's talk about some of the ultrastructure that we can see in especially those electron microscopes. So prokaryotic cells, remember that pro rhymes with no. So we're talking about things that do not have a nucleus basically our bacteria cells. So these guys have no internal compartments. They still have things floating around inside their cells, but there aren't any, there aren't any compartments that are wrapped up in membrane bubbles. So that's the one big difference between prokaryotic cells and the eukaryotic cells. So this bacteria cell is going to have a cell wall. Whoa, that was not a very good outline of that cell wall. And then inside the cell wall, there's a cell membrane. So, so it does have a cell or a plasma membrane, but that's pretty much it. Um, nothing else, no other pieces of membrane inside the cell. There's going to be some cytoplasm, the juicy stuff inside a cell. There are going to be some ribosomes. These are smaller than the ribosomes that are in our cells. We call them 70S because of how they sink when we send them through a centrifuge or we spin them really fast. And then there's also this space, this region where the DNA likes to hang out. We call that the nucleoid. Because it's not exactly a nucleus, but it's like a nucleus, so humanoid, nucleoid, nucleus-ish, but not exactly a nucleus, because there's not a membrane surrounding the DNA. So bacteria cells have this crazy big chromosome that kind of gets tangled up like a wad of yarn, but there's no membrane surrounding that DNA. It's just a clump of DNA in the cell. So we call that the nucleoid, the region in the cell where the DNA is not wrapped up in any membrane. So, so another cool structure that our bacteria cells have are these stringy things. And if this was a eukaryotic cell, we would call these flagella, but because it's a prokaryote, they are not flagella. They are instead pili. And we use them for, we don't, the bacteria. The bacteria use them for attachment. So they might help to attach to a surface, but they definitely help attach to other bacteria, which is a super cool process in which they trade little pieces of DNA. And it's great for bacteria because it improves their genetic variation. It's really bad for us because this is how bacteria can share antibiotic resistance, which we humans really don't love. Um, so pili, Pilus is one, so one pilus, many pili, these stringy things coming off our prokaryotic cell. How these prokaryotes, these bacteria, reproduce is through a process called binary fission, which is a lot like mitosis. Remember mitosis from freshman bio is how cells divide. Mitosis, though, is all about the nucleus. There's no nucleus, there's no mitosis. And so the process by which bacteria, prokaryotic cells divide is called binary fission which is a pretty easy thing to remember. Bi means two, fission means split. The cells are splitting into two, binary fission.
Here's a lovely photo um, from an electron microscope of bacteria going through binary fission. So this cell just got really big and decided to pinch in. Well, they don't decide things, they just do it. Uh, the cell membrane pinched in a little bit, some cell wall got built, and now we went from one cell to two cells. What's pretty cool about bacteria? Well, I mean, it can, it's cool for them. Again, not so cool for us in our immune systems. Bacteria in ideal conditions can go through this process just about every 20 minutes. So the number of bacteria can double just about every 20 minutes, which is amazing if you are a bacteria, maybe not so much if you're trying to kill the bacteria. So uh, IB might ask you in a question on a test to draw and label a prokaryotic cell. How are we going to do that? We are going to draw a cell wall and you could even color it in a little bit if you wanted to make it uh, pretty. <laughs> I should not teach art, clearly. On the inside of that cell wall, you're going to draw a cell membrane and you'll label those. So we've got our cell wall. We've got our cell or plasma membrane. So those are the same things. Cell membrane, plasma membrane, totally the same thing. Inside the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, we're going to have some cytoplasm. That's just the juicy stuff uh, that floats around inside the cell, the cytoplasm. And inside that cytoplasm, we're going to have some little dots. Those are the ribosomes. The purpose of a ribosome is to produce proteins. We're going to have a squiggly mess of DNA somewhere in the cell. We're going to call that the nucleoid, not the nucleus, but the nucleoid. And you could also label, label that as DNA or the chromosome. We could also add, um, so I mentioned that DNA uh, can be traded or shared between bacteria. And the little pieces of DNA that can get traded are called plasmids. So you could also add a plasmid to your bacteria cell picture. Voila, here is a prokaryotic cell. Oh, we could also add some P like. So if you wanted to draw some squigglies, we could add some P like. Good. Let's switch over to eukaryotic cells. So these eukaryotes are more complex, more things to know about them because we have all these compartments, all these little bubbles inside this cell. And the benefit is that we can concentrate or keep in one spot metabolites. Metabolites are things like enzymes. We don't necessarily want enzymes that digest proteins running around digesting all of our proteins. We just want them to digest the right proteins. So we can control where those enzymes are by keeping them in compartments. We can also put waste products into little bubbles and keep them away from the rest of our cell. And it allows us to have multiple internal conditions within the cell. So hopefully remember that word homeostasis from, again, ninth grade bio. Homeostasis is maintaining some internal condition, a temperature, a water level, a salt level, a sugar level. The magic of our having all these little pieces and parts inside our cell is that we can have one part where it's higher sugar, another part where it's lower, one part where the pH is quite acidic, another part where the pH is quite basic. So lots of options for different conditions. We can carry out different functions in the same cell. So here uh, is a lovely video. I hope it works. Just a quick uh, look at a vesicle. So, so this big blue guy is uh -oh, a bubble, membrane-bound bubble. Oh, dear. Let's try again. It's a membrane-bound bubble um, that's being carried by a protein. So this weird walking thing is a piece of protein that's using energy in the form of ATP to move along a track of a different kind of protein um, carrying a vesicle. And so the cells cannot just have different compartments with different uh, conditions, but we can also drag those bubbles around the cell. So pretty amazing. So here's a lovely animal cell picture, lots of pieces and parts in here that we need to know. This is maybe not quite as easy to see as when we color code it like this.
So let's go ahead and label some of the pieces and parts in here. And then we'll go back to the one without the color and label it too. So this big guy here, of course, is going to be the nucleus because animal cells are eukaryotic and they do have a nucleus. This is a nucleus. Inside the nucleus, we have some mushy stuff. This is unraveled DNA. So DNA when it's not in a chromosome form, and we call that chromatin. Chromatin is DNA and some proteins that like to stick to the DNA um, that is not wrapped up in a chromosome shape. All these squiggly paths around the cell are ER or endoplasmic reticulum, retic, oops, I lost you, reticulum. Um, and this is the transport system of the cell. There are generally lots of little dots along the ER. Those are ribosomes that are stuck to the ER and make that ER look rough. So we can talk about rough ER, has ribosomes stuck to it, smooth ER, does not have any of those ribosomes stuck to it. These little guys are mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. What does that even mean? It makes energy for us. Well, it doesn't make energy, it processes energy. You can't make energy. Law of conservation of energy says not. This is a Golgi apparatus, Golgi apparatus, uh, and its job is to take the proteins that are being made by the ribosomes on the ER and then put them into these little bubbles called vesicles. Vesicles. And then those vesicles can be secreted out of the cell to go do other cool stuff. So we have our uh, nucleus. We have lots of mitochondria all over the place, all kinds of rough ER. Um, and then that lovely gold G. Let's look at the not colored picture and see if we can find those things again. Nucleus, pretty easy to see with that chromatin floating around in there. So again, here's our nucleus. Lots of chromatin floating around in here. All these squiggly lines, lots of rough ER with those dots are going to be ribosomes. When we start to get like some curly Q uh, ER, this would be Golgi apparatus, which is sometimes hard to tell apart from the ER. So I wouldn't worry too much. Here's probably better Golgi. It's a little bit curvier. So there's some more Golgi um, with those vesicles coming off of the Golgi. And then we could also totally label the cell membrane here along the outside. And then of course there's some cytoplasm, the juicy stuff floating around inside the cell and then lots and lots of mitochondria. And that's an animal cell, lots of pieces and parts to know. And again, in color. So you might be asked at some point on a test to draw and label an animal cell. You are going to draw a blobish style shape um, and call that the plasma or the cell membrane. And of course, inside we're going to have some cytoplasm. You wanna draw a nucleus. You could have that chromatin inside. Sometimes we also could add a nucleolus. Um, this is the part of the nucleus that produces ribosomes. Speaking of ribosomes, we could have coming off of the nucleus, we could have some ER, lots of curly, curly ER. We could add some dots to show that it is rough ER. We could have toward the end of our ER, we could have some Golgi where it curls up a little bit and then some vesicles coming off. We could add some smooth ER so ER that doesn't have ribosomes stuck to it. We, of course, need to add some mitochondria. And those look like little kidney beans with some stripes inside. And certainly we didn't uh, add all of the things that we could have added to an animal cell, but this is good. So there's our mitochondria. Here's some smooth ER that rough ER, 
vesicles Golgi. Good. All right. Let's look at a plant cell. So here are lots of things in a plant cell. There it is in color, a little bit easier to see. Those green guys, you can probably guess, are chloroplasts. The job of the chloroplast is photosynthesis. Whoa, I almost lost that word. These littler guys are mitochondria, and it's not that the mitochondria in a plant cell is smaller than the mitochondria in an animal cell. It is just that plant cells are bigger, and so the mitochondria look smaller inside because there's more space. Chloroplasts are much larger than mitochondria. Uh, here we've got a nucleus, and then there's that nucleolus that helps to make the ribosomes. So there's our nucleus and the nucleolus. Lots of chloroplasts, lots of mitochondria, lots of cytoplasm, just like in an animal cell. Chloroplasts are not in animal cells, they're only in plant cells. This big guy is also unique to plant cells. This is what we call a central vacuole. It stores lots of water and some minerals that help that plant carry out um, photosynthesis. And then two things more to add, um, label in our picture. So just inside the cell wall, we're going to have the cell membrane. So there is a cell membrane in plant cells, but it kind of sticks to the inside of the cell wall. So it's hard to see in the picture separate from the cell wall, unless we dehydrate the cell, then it's pretty easy to see. So these are all the pieces and parts of our plant cell. If we go back to the not colorized version, it's still pretty easy to find that cell wall. And then of course the membrane is going to be just inside the cell wall we have some chloroplasts, we have the central vacuole for water storage, we have some mitochondria, the nucleus, the nucleolus, and cytoplasm. Mashed up in that cytoplasm, it's hard to see in this uh, depth of the slice. There's also going to be some endoplasmic reticulum. They're going to be ribosomes. Plants make proteins. Um, and so all those pieces and parts are also in the plant cell. They just get kind of mashed up around those, those chloroplasts. So again, you might need to draw and label a plant cell. You are going to make it a little more squarish than you made your animal cell. You are going to have a cell wall, and then just inside we'll have that cell membrane. Voila. Keep it on the inside. I know my lines crossed a little bit. Don't let that happen. Um, and then you're going to have a large central vacuole. You'll have a nucleus with a nucleolus, have some chloroplasts, have some mitochondria. And then you could throw in some ER, some ribosomes, that's cytoplasm. Good, good. All right. There are lots of organelles. So, so in a human body, we have organs. In a cell, we have organelles, tiny little pieces that have specialized functions. So one of the organelles that we need to know is the nucleus. And here is an example of a nucleus in a cell. What's pretty cool about the nucleus is that it has a double membrane. So this membrane is a, a phospholipid bilayer, double membrane, unlike um, the lysosomes that we're going to look at on the next slide. So double membrane. And here we have that nucleolus, nucle, nu Nucleolus um, that produces ribosomes. And then out here is going to be unraveled DNA that we call, whoa, chromatin. So chromatin is our unraveled DNA inside the double membrane bound nucleus. Here we have a mitochondria. Mitochondria are also double membrane. And we learned about that when we talked about the origin of cells, that endosymbiotic theory. So we have a double membrane. And then what's pretty cool is that the inner membrane of the mitochondria curl up in these little uh, waves and folds. And we call those cristae. We'll learn a lot about the mitochondria in our next unit. So double membrane, cristae, 
Um, the inside of the mitochondria is called the matrix. So you have matrix in the middle. Criste are the folds of the inner membrane, double membrane, mitochondria. This is our mitochondria. Here we have a chloroplast only found in plant cells, not in our animal cells. These uh, darker regions are layers of membrane called thylakoid. This is our thylakoid, whoa, T-H-Y, T-H-Y-L-A-K-O-I-D, thylakoid membrane. And that stack of thylakoid membrane, this stack of thylakoid membrane is called a granum. Connecting the granums are lamella, lamella. And the juicy part of the chloroplast that's outside of the thylakoid is called stroma. And just like the, the mitochondria, the chloroplast has a double membrane. Good. So here, we're going to pop back up to this guy. So here's some rough ER. So we can see um, that it's kind of speckled along the outside of those transports, uh, transport paths. So this is rough ER, rough endoplasmic reticulum, because it is uh, uh, ribosomes are bound to the ER. Those ribosomes are going to make proteins. Those proteins are going to get dumped into the ER, and the ER is going to transport those proteins to the Golgi. The Golgi is going to put those proteins into little bubbles called the vesicles, and those vesicles are going to be released to, to leave the cell. So it might be a kind of hormone or an enzyme that needs to be secreted out of the cell. The job of the rough ER is to make those proteins and then transport the proteins to the Golgi, which is what this guy is right here. So here's our Golgi. So, so the rough ER kind of merges into the Golgi. The job of the Golgi is to take those proteins that were made by the ribosomes on the rough ER and then package them into these little bubbles called vesicles vesicles. And then you can kind of see this guy is starting to merge with the outside of the membrane. And so the stuff that was in the vesicle, in the vesicles that got bundled up by the Golgi that got made and transported by the rough ER, can be released outside the cell and it'll just float away and go do its job somewhere else. So on this slide, our organelles to know, the nucleus double membrane bound, nucleolus, makes ribosomes. Here's our mitochondria, double membrane bound. The inner membrane is folded into little things called cristae. The job of the mitochondria is to make ATP, ATP, powerhouse of the cell, whatever that means. Here we have the chloroplast. The job of the chloroplast is to carry out photosynthesis. So using energy from the sun to, to um, bind energy into chemical bonds in sugar molecules. It is also double membrane bound, lots of membranes inside the membrane um, called thylakoid. And this is where photosynthesis occurs. Um, here we have the rough ER with ribosomes. Ribosomes make proteins. The ER transports the proteins to the Golgi. The Golgi takes those proteins, bubbles them, bundles them up into these little bubbles called vesicles. Those vesicles can be released to the external environment of the cell. Here are some more organelles to know. So we talked about rough ER on the previous page. This is smooth ER. So smooth ER, instead of um, producing proteins with ribosomes, there are no ribosomes on the smooth ER. The ribosomes are what make it rough. Smooth ER is instead involved in lipid production. So we're gonna make some fats and oils here on the smooth ER. We had ribosomes on the rough ER, but we can have what we call free ribosomes. So ribosomes that are just floating around the cell, not stuck to any of the ER. And these guys are also going to make proteins, but they're going to make proteins that stay inside the cell as opposed to the ribosomes making proteins on the ER that got transported to the Golgi for excretion out of the cell. So free ribosomes make proteins that stay in the cell, those membrane-bound ribosomes on the ER instead make proteins that are secreted out of the cell. Here we have a mitochondria, but stuck to the mitochondria is a lysosome. So this bubble is a lysosome. And what's pretty cool about this lysosome is that it is not 
double membrane bound like all the other organelles that we've talked about so far. So instead, this lysosome is a single membrane and it contains enzymes. So this mitochondria is either damaged or old or otherwise needs to be digested. And so the lysosome is going to merge with the mitochondria dump its enzymes into the mitochondria and then digest the mitochondria so that the pieces and parts of the mitochondria can be recycled and turned into something else. One more little picture here on this page. So this is a close-up view of the vesicles that we were talking about on the on the last screen. So if I go back one, we're talking about these little vesicles um, coming off the Golgi. So this is just a close-up view of that vesicle um, it is going to contain whatever stuff the cell is making, and then it's going to be released into the external environment. Vesicle. Good. So there are two kinds of cells that IB really loves to talk about. Exocrine gland cell is one, and then palisade mesophyll cell is on the next. So exocrine gland, you've probably heard of endocrine glands. The endocrine system makes hormones. Those hormones kind of ooze out of of uh, tissues and go-to jobs. So exocrine glands are a little bit different in that stuff is specifically secreted into some kind of duct. So an example of an exocrine gland um, would be the pancreas. So the pancreas makes some stuff that gets sent into a tube and then that tube carries that stuff somewhere else. The small intestine is where it gets carried. So exocrine glands um, are glands that simply secrete things, hormones, proteins, enzymes, into ducts, into little tubes where, where they get dumped someplace specific. So, so in this exocrine gland cell that we're looking at, and this is a pancreas cell, so of course we've got our nucleus and the nucleolus. You can see lots of rough ER because this guy is making a lot of protein. Um, we do have some little pieces of mitochondria floating around in here. Remember that the cell is three-dimensional. And so when we take a picture of it, we like slice it. And so there are lots of things up and down in the cell. Um, this is just one tiny little layer of what you could find in the cell. So the, the mitochondria don't look like mitochondria. It's just because they were probably oriented up and down instead of flat across this cross-section. All of these guys, these are the guys that we're super excited about in an exocrine gland cell. These are all vesicles, and you can see that the vesicles are starting to merge here with the outside of the cell and stuff. The stuff that's in all the vesicles is getting dumped outside the cell. So this is the lumen. Lumen is a word that we use for a space. So anything that has a space has a lumen. So in this space outside the cell and the lumen between these cells, um, we are dumping all this stuff and then it's going to go through a tube. And since this is pancreas, it's going to dump all this cool stuff, these enzymes and bicarbonate and other things that the pancreas makes. Um, it's going to get dumped into the small intestine to aid in digestion. So exocrine gland cells, super um, important protein producers. So you're going to see a lot of rough ER. So you can make lots of proteins. You're going to see lots of vesicles. Those proteins can be secreted from the cell. There should be some Golgi in there, which is sometimes hard to find. Um, but anytime the ER looks curly like here, it is Golgi. And um, lots of mitochondria too, which in this picture are harder to see. I think they're probably closer to the outside of the cells. One last slide, one last kind of cell that Ivy loves to talk about on their tests, is the palisade mesophyll cell. So palisade mesophyll cells, you can see by the shape, are probably plant cells because they're pretty square. These guys are found in leaves, and these are the primary photosynthetic cells of plants. So their job, more than any other cell type in the plant, is to carry out photosynthesis. This huge empty space in the middle is not empty. It is filled with water and minerals. This is that central vacuole that is common to plant cells. These guys, these darker colored guys, these are all the chloroplasts that are going to lay outside the cell so that they can capture as much sunlight as possible. We're going to have, here's the nucleus some little mitochondria floating around in there, smaller than the chloroplasts. Um, and then of course we've got cell wall helping to keep that cell a little bit more uh, square-ish 
than those animal cells. Um, and then we, of course, would have some cytoplasm, some ER, all that good stuff in the cell. Good. That's all we've got for ultra structure of cells. Um, next lesson is going to be on membrane structure. Should be fun.